Okay, welcome back guys. Chapter 25. Uh, I'm going to knock this out today and get it posted for you. Uh, I just sent my a quick little emergency response guidebook. Uh, just a quick reference. Uh, some of the stuff that it was going over uh, for that particular section at the end of chapter 24. So make sure you look over that. Make sure you guys are reading through your terms. Make sure you're also starting to identify those tankers. Uh, remember, uh, today is uh, Sunday the 29th, and so I'll get this posted, probably try to get the last chapter out, sometimes maybe later at the end of this week, but you pretty much know that by the uh, first of next week we will, we will start testing, and hopefully I'll have, uh, we already have the canvas test, hopefully I'll have the minor test on there, so we'll do the, uh, basically, uh, the canvas and the minor and so I'm going to get started I'm going to be kind of looking off kind of going through the lesson plan you can follow through the lesson plan or the book if you need to I'll go over the you know hot spots I'll also uh, be there's going to be some things we need to add and I know it's kind of I know it's not the you know favorite thing to do as far as sit here and listen to a video for an hour and a half, two hours, but it's the only thing we can do at this particular time until everything kind of passes and hopefully we can get back into class pretty soon. All right, so I'm going to start off predetermined procedures. Uh, developing an appropriate incident action plan is vital. Mistakes made in initial response can make the difference between solving the problem and becoming part of the problem. Now, definitely something we need to know as far as what the incident commander, what is the incident commander responsible for? Know this, developing an incident action plan, identifying response objectives and options. Know also that all responders must understand the process and no tasks that they may be asked to perform. Okay, despite variations, hazmat incidents typically share some similarities. Similarities are based for an organization, uh, that's going to be your standard operating procedures and also your emergency response plans. Now, you need to add this. We're talking about what the incident commander, what they're responsible for. We also want to know that the incident commander, uh, whenever you did uh, your NIMS chapter, you do know that the command staff uh, for the incident commander has a safety officer. Well, at any hazmat uh, response, we're, we're definitely going to have a, a safety officer assigned, and that would be through the command staff. Now, there, most of the time that actual safety officer may have an assistant safety officer that's assigned to the hazmat group. So, we definitely need to know that the incident commander will assign a safety officer pretty much to all hazmat incidents. The incident commander should review the incident action plan with the safety officer and then that safety officer of course that has an assistant that may be assigned to him needs to review that uh, action plan with them uh, as well <clears throat> also add this hazmat operations hazmat operations is that's who's going to be controlling the tactical portion of the incident. Now your SOPs, some of your considerations for your SOPs. Is this a chemical response? Is it a biological response, radiological response, explosive, WMD, or any sort of significant incident type responses? When unforeseen circumstances occur, standard guidelines have a built-in flexibility and allow adjustment with reasonable justification. First few units that reach the scene usually initiate predetermined actions. Initial response actions supplement, but do not replace the incident size up. Other decisions based on professional judgment, evaluation, or command. Several predetermined, uh, predetermined procedures may be available from which to choose depending on the incident severity, the location, and the ability of the first in units to achieve control. One of the first in units definitely, uh, maybe they're not a hazmat team, but they can definitely take command and start to try to gain control of the scene. So that's definitely something that you could do. 
Now know this, following predetermined procedures reduces chaos. Know that all resources can be used in a coordinated effort to rescue victims, stabilize the incident, and protect the environment and property. Operational procedures that are standardized, clearly written, and mandated to each department organization member. They establish accountability and increase command and control effectiveness. Predetermined procedures. They help duplicate, prevent duplication of effort and uncoordinated operations because all positions are assigned and covered. Describe assumption and transfer of command, communication procedures, tactical procedures. SOP should define your role according to your training level. Procedures may be considerably in different localities, but principles are usually the same. You must know of your agency's emergency response plan and written SOPs. All predetermined procedures must keep the incident priorities, and this is a gimme. You always have to know these in order. Life safety, incident stabilization, and protection of property. He always keep that in mind. Uh, be designed, also be designed to enhance those priorities. Okay, I'm on page 12, 19, initiating protective actions. Protective actions can ensure safety, notification, isolation, scene control. Often taken by first responders to arrive at the scene even before the incident command has been established or incident management has been implemented. Separating people from the potential source of harm prevents spread of hazardous materials through cross-contamination. The incident commander will conduct size up on arrival, may revise the protective actions initiated based upon his or her observations. Notification and request for assistance. Predetermined procedures should define roles in the notification process and methods for communications. You need to know at awareness level personnel, awareness level, notification may be as simple as calling 911 to report an incident or to request emergency assistance. And add to that uh, awareness level and notification is surveying the incident, survey the incident. Fixed facility responders may have their own initial procedures to follow. And you need to know also if criminal or terrorist activity is suspected, personnel should notify law enforcement immediately. Any sort of terrorist activities, law enforcement. Department SOPs usually cover communication methods at incidents, whether by radio, cell phone, or hand signals. Personnel and responders must be able to communicate the need for assistance through their department organizations and communications might be requested for additional personnel or special equipment to notify others at the incident of any apparent hazards. Personnel and responders must be trained to use communication equipment assigned to them in accordance with policies and procedures. Emergency response plans must ensure that responders understand their role in notification processes it's better to dispatch more resources than necessary as an initial response to ensure appropriate weight of attack to combat these incident conditions. Know that. Uh, whether you're in route, whether you just uh, were dispatched, if you feel that you need more resources up front, go ahead and call for either the, a second alarm or however you a hazmat group, whatever you need to do, go ahead and call them out. It's easier to cancel and send them back than to get on scene and then realize that you need more personnel. Responders should be familiar with assets available in their jurisdictions because hazmat incidents have the potential to overwhelm local resources. Responders must know the procedures to request and additional assets. Uh, so, you know, just incidents may need to call uh, law enforcement, Coast Guard, uh, mutual aid, whatever you need, uh, but get it moving as quickly as possible. Uh, so that the sooner we get it moving, the sooner we get on scene, and of course, the sooner we may mitigate this hazard. The process should describe, uh, be described in your local district, regional, state, and national emergency response plans. 
Notification involves contact with law enforcement. Of course, when terror uh, or criminal incidents are suspected, involves notifying other agencies, public works, and the local emergency operations center. Follow your procedures according to your authority having jurisdiction. Uh, a natural, uh, national response framework, this is something that was in NIMS, uh, details notification process in the United States. All local, state, and federal emergencies uh, response plans must comply. And you can actually read on page 1220, uh, you can read up through those weapons of mass destruction, disaster medical assistance teams, those things. You can read those. Uh, so we're going to move on and move over to page 1221, Isolation and Scene Control. Okay. Isolation and Scene Control. Add this. Keep everyone not involved away from the scene. Uh, could be something you could do on your initial, uh, when you do arrive at scene, one of the initial things you do when you take command is maybe move people away from the scene, get control of the scene. So keep everyone that's not involved away from the scene. Sometimes that could be firefighters and law enforcement also. Now, if you feel that they're contaminated, then you're going to hold them. You're not going to let them just disperse, and you're going to try to make sure that we don't have any sort of secondary contamination. All right, so isolation and scene control, uh, physically securing and maintaining the emergency scene. Establish isolation perimeters or corridors, denying entry to unauthorized persons. We need to know also preventing contaminated or potentially contaminated individuals from leaving the scene in order to stop the spread of hazardous materials. So make sure you understand all three of those. We need to know what the isolation perimeter is. The isolation perimeter is an outer perimeter or outer cordon boundary established to prevent unauthorized access and to egress from the scene. If incident is inside a building, personnel posted at entrance can deny entry and exit from the building in order to set the isolation perimeter. If the incident is outdoors, the perimeter might be set at surrounding intersections with response vehicles or law enforcement officers diverting vehicle traffic and pedestrians. Some of the things you can use, ropes, cones, barrier tape, anything of that nature to actually establish this perimeter. In some cases, uh, traffic cordon may be established beyond the outer cordon to prevent unauthorized vehicle access while still allowing for pedestrian traffic. Mm -hmm. Evacuation process may continue, and these are some things we're going to get a little more detailed into. Evacuation. Defending in place and sheltering in place. Uh, one of the things that were just ordered here in the city. Uh, they're calling it uh, stay at home, but it's basically kind of a shelter in place. Can be expanded or reduced as needed. If you remember from last time, it's easier when we're setting up any sort of perimeters. It's easier to go large and then we can always make it smaller. That's easier than going small and trying to make it larger. You may need assistance from law enforcement to maintain these isolation perimeters. In most cases, the outcomes of an on-site risk assessment determine the initial isolation perimeter established. Once the scene is secure and isolation perimeter has been established and controlled, the awareness level responders are likely uh, not trained to necessary levels to continue mitigation of the incident. So as, as an awareness level, you may be pretty much at your scope of practice, uh, which means any other thing that uh, requires any sort of defensive measures, especially offensive measures, you are now beyond, that would be beyond your scope of practice. So you've done pretty much what you can do. Now the other players need to come and get involved. Exception to this rule, awareness level responders may be trained to mitigate the initial are incidental releases without calling for assistance. So there might be, it depends on the authority having jurisdiction, what sort of level and what you're allowed to do. But for the most part, you have identified this is a, an emergency or a hazmat incident. You've called uh, and notified 
uh, individuals that need to be responding. But if you can help with identify, identifying using your ERG, that's definitely something that could be helpful. For more information about response and inc incidental releases, uh, see CFR 1910-120, which is the HAZWAPR. Once resources have been committed to an incident, it is easier to reduce the isolation perimeter. I've already mentioned that. The IC must undertake a risk assessment or size up of the incident in order to determine an appropriate size for the isolation perimeter. To determine the perimeter size, the IC should consult with other on site agency commanders to ensure that the requirements and tactical objectives of other agencies can be met. Okay. So now I'm moving on to emergency response centers. Emergency response centers, page 1222. Emergency response centers can provide useful information and guidance to first responders. The ERG provides contact information for emergency response centers anywhere from the US, Canada, Mexico, Colombia. So contact numbers are listed in those white pages and that's in the video that I sent earlier. In the US, several emergency response centers such as Chemical Transportation Emergency Center, Chemtrek, are not government operated. Uh, Chemtrek was established by a chemical industry as a public service hotline. Know that. Expert staff in these centers can provide 24-hour assistance to personnel responding to hazmat incidents. Remember, Canada, dangerous goods. Okay, I'm moving on now to, on 1223, Size Up and Hazard and Risk Assessments. You can read through the rest of that on page uh, 1222 and 1223. Size Up and Hazard Risk Assessment. See how many minutes I've got going here. 17. Oh, we're just, just getting started, guys. Describe the process of size up and risk assessment. Upon arrival at an incident, the incident commander assesses the incident conditions to recognize clues indicating problems or potential problems. Know that. We need to know what size up. This is this process. The size up is the mental process of considering all available factors that will affect the incident during the operational operations course. So we need to know size up is this process of recognizing clues. Add this, it can also be an eight step process. Size up can be an eight step process also. Information gained is used to determine the response objective, which are the strategies, and the action options, which are the tactics. To complete the strategies, which is the overall goal, incident stabilization, life safety, you have to establish objectives, which are your tactics. <clears throat> Hazard risk assessment. Make sure you know that is part of size up. That focuses particularly on dangers, hazards, and risk. Continual evaluation. Know that it starts with pre-incident planning and continues throughout the incident response operation. First on scene. Conducts an extensive size up. Need to know. First on scene, whoever takes command, conducts an extensive size up, continues assessing hazards throughout the incident. And they also alter the mitigation process as appropriate to Minim, minimize risk and minim, maximize the benefit. So make sure you look over that. During the hazmat uh, size up, the IC must consider all sides of the incident. Now, one thing we need to know when it talks about all sides, look on 1224, figure 29, uh, 29, nine, or 25.9, I'm sorry. Six sides of the incident six sides of the incident. So we got the bottom, the top, both sides, so six sides of the incident. Um, that's frequently uh, complicated by limited information or has ability to access the scene during the hazmat hazards present. The IC's view of the incident may be limited 
size of the hazard area, location of the release, limited or conflicting information regarding the product or products involved is possible. Know that. that can be, you can have conflicting information. Now, what's nice now is the use of drones. We do have drones and we are able to put these drones in the air and that definitely helps uh, whenever we're trying to get a look of whatever size, six sides, five sides, as many sides as we can get without putting personnel close to that incident. So drones have definitely become a, a useful tool in all services. All right, the initial, uh, initial assessment is based on the anticipated conditions and updated as additional information becomes available. The following uh, information is needed for hazard and risk assessments to be obtained at the time of the incident is reported. So this is some, some things I need you to know, and it's just a few of them. Uh, you need to know at the time the incident reported, the number and type of injuries, the occupancy type and the type of incident. Uh, definitely something that you need to know. Uh, something that you should do, you know, just from your initial size up when you come to work is time of day, what the weather is like, uh, maybe even we've talked about before in your clues, location of the incident. Once on scene, additional pieces of hazard and risk assessments are needed. That can be the wind direction. You can call for that in route, the topography, the land use, do you have any victims, the presence of victims, equipment access, and available response personnel? You're going to need to know some of these additional surveys. The initial surveys should consider where is the incident seen? Know that. Where is the incident seen? What are the hazardous materials? Know that. What are the hazardous materials involved? Also know this. Is it a terrorist attack? or another criminal uh, incident. We also need to know what hazard class are involved. That's going to tell us those potential hazards. It is a fire. Is it a health hazard? Uh, the quantities, how much? Uh, something we went over earlier, concentration times time equals the poison. How much are we dealing with? So also added to that is the concentrations involved. So know the quantities and the concentrations and also how could the material react. So make sure you know all of those. We'll see them again. Uh, what state of matter is it in? What solid liquid gas? What kind of container holds the material? Is the container breached? Is it stressed? Which leads us to knowing you need to know what is the condition of the container. And you also need to know how much time has elapsed since the incident began. If we do have a breach and we are leaking out some sort of a chemical product, uh, always uphill upwind, but we can start our pluming model. Uh, so that way we can start alerting people downwind of that if, if we need be. So know what effect can the weather have on you. Uh, whether it's a windy day, not that windy, is it humid outside, all those things come into play. Is it raining? Uh, other things you need to just kind of remember, uh, look for overhead wires. Uh, definitely make sure that we are uh, doing some sort of defensive measures around storm drains, sewer drains. Uh, so when the incident requires a rescue, a rescue, consider the following variables before rushing into a potentially dangerous situation. I told you guys last week or middle of last week that one thing we do in a hazmat incident, and we should do it a lot of incidents, is start slowing down and basically hitting the brakes and looking at everything around us before we rush into something. Uh, make sure we have the right personal protective gear on before we rush into something because this could be an, a person who is down because of a chemical incident. And we don't want to walk into there without any sort of uh, inhalation protection, SCBA. All right, so potentially dangerous situation, uh, situation could be a risk to the rescuers, ability of rescuers to protect themselves, the probab probability of rescue, difficulty of rescue, capabilities of resources of on-scene forces, and the possibilities of explosions or sudden material releases. 
Is it a rescue or is it a recovery? That's going to make a difference in what sort of risk that we're going to take. All right, we need to know, and I'm on page 1226 now, we need to know that after the material has been identified, responders can use references. Those are going to determine, and know this, to determine health, physical hazards presented by the material, and the level of risk pre presented by the material. Here's some references that we can use. The safety data sheets, or the MSDS, or the SDS, whichever one you want to call it. The, the shipping papers. Remember the shipping papers we talked about earlier? The bill of lading, way bill, uh, train bill, air bill. Uh, other written or computer references, and also the, the general information or the generic information that's provided by the emergency response guidebook. So we need to know that. Uh, just know manufacturers, shippers, and carriers may provide additional response information such as hazard behavior and other recommendations. Emergency contact information may be provided on those shipping papers, pipeline markings, or other container markings. And again, you can always use Chemtra. Your ERG and other sources, uh, first responders should be able to predict or attempt to predict where the hazardous material may be going, given, and know this, where it might be going by its physical state of matter. Is it a liquid? Is it a gas? Or is it a solid? The environmental conditions present, is it night, day, wind, no wind, indoors, outdoors? You need to know that. Monitoring and detection devices can be employed to determine the concentration of the material and the spread of the material. Given this information, responders can estimate the size of the endangered area, potential exposures, that's going to be the number of people, buildings, and property. The environmental concerns in the area are there sewer drains, streams, lakes, ponds, wells, those sort of things. Okay, I'm on page 1227, surrounding conditions. All right, in addition to identifying hazmat containers and their contents, first responders need to survey surrounding conditions. Those are going to be potential site hazards, such as overhead and power lines, potential ignition sources, potential victims and exposures, weather, topography, information about building and building components. Some side hazards. Hazmat incidents can occur anywhere. If the incident occurs on or near rail lines, responders should protect themselves. Victims property from passing trains. That just gives you an example. They can occur anywhere. Uh, highways, bridges, any of those natures. Uh, overhead power lines have been uh, knocked down. Have they been knocked down? On-site uh, specific hazards could present potential contamination, environmental, or thermal hazards. Potential ignition sources. Intrinsically safe is one of those terms that you need to know for tools that we might use in any area that might have a potential ignition source. Intrinsically safe. If the incident involves a flammable combustible material, you must avoid igniting these materials. Even if the material involved at the incident has not been identified, remove ignition sources. You know, turning off a vehicle, those sort of things, uh, just depends on the type of material or that we're dealing with, uh, but that's all that process of trying to identify what we're dealing with. Uh, flammable gases and vapors can travel to unexpected places and tend to settle in low-lying areas. Uh, there's a YouTube video that's pretty interesting to watch. Hopefully we'll get a chance to, I'll show you where you've got a plume that is traveling at a low area for quite a distance. And basically, this was from a train derailment. Uh, it found an ignition source, and I believe it was at a residential home, and it was a, maybe like a pilot light of a uh, hot water heater or something of that nature. can't remember the whole incident, but it found an ignition source, and basically... That entire plume uh, for the distance that it was on the ground was pretty much uh, engulfed in flames. Many potential uh, ignition sources may exist at the scene of a hazardous material incident including open flames, static electricity, pilot lights. Electrical sources include non-explosive proof electrical equipment, internal combustion engines and vehicles and generators. That, any of that could produce an ignition source. Actions that can 
uh, ignition or flammable actions that can ignite flammable explosive atmospheres, uh, opening or closing a switch. Uh, remember I told you about natural gas, if it collects in a home over 25%, simply as uh, something as simple as turning on a light switch uh, could ignite and make the, the entire house could explode. Uh, turning on a flashlight, operating a radio, potential victims and exposures. Responders must quickly identify potential victims and exposures. Uh, potential exposures could be people, property, or the environment. I'm going to go on now on page 1229, the weather. If the incident is outdoors, the weather can dramatically affect how the incident process and is mitigated. If temperatures are below freezing, it may be impractical or impossible to use water for decontamination or dilution. Hot temperatures may cause liquids to evap evaporate more quickly, producing more vapors or potentially raising, uh, or ra uh, rising a flammable material's temperature to its ignition point. The wind direction may determine where and how far gases, vapors, or solids are particulates that uh, they could travel. Time of day. Time of day can influence the chemical behavior due to the conditions typically present, uh, of course, at night. Now, this is, goes into your green section of your uh, thermal uh, or your uh, toxic insulation hazards or inhalation hazards on your ear, in your ERG. So at night, day, large spills, small spills. So at night, one thing I mentioned in the previous video, uh, night winds tend to be lighter, so gases and vapors will typically travel, not travel as far. It could be a little more humid, especially in the southern parts of the United States. Um, some areas tend to be cooler, so liquids tend to not evaporate as rapidly. Uh, temperature gradients may be significantly different in, air, in uh, different areas due to the topography and bodies of water. Topography is a significant difference in the considerations needed to determine the appropriate isolation distance. So the lay of the land, uh, that's going to be something else that you're going to be uh, putting into your, uh, whenever you're sizing this up and determining your actions. Just remember the ERG, the green border pages, the sign, that's going to help you define the initial isolation distance. I'm going to go down to building information for incidents occurring indoors. The following information may be relevant. Location of floor drains, air handling ducts, location and components of fire protection and detection equipment, location of gas, electric, and water shutoffs, and the presence of potential backup generators. Okay, situational awareness on page 1230. Okay, situational awareness, hazmat incidents. Effective mitigation of any hazardous material incident requires that emergency responders establish and maintain situational awareness of the event. Okay, we need to know this. More than just a size up. This is a continuous process, continuous process. That's going to include size up, interpreting signs, assessing what is happening over the life of the incident, and predicting outcomes based on a plan of action. We need to know those. We also need to know that maintaining situational awareness is one of the greatest challenges to emergency responders as the process is also met with barriers such as comp uh, competing priorities, distractions, and information overload. We need to know those three ABC. <clears throat> failure to establish and maintain situational awareness is likely to result in failure to achieve the desired outcome sometimes referred to as a process working at three levels. Level one, <clears throat> perceive the situation around us. Level two, apply knowledge and past experience to our precipitation, perception, I'm sorry, to our perception and development of understanding of the meaning of the situation. And three, the understanding of the situation and apply it to the future, thereby predicting how and when the situation will change 
and what action is appropriate on our part. Loss of situational awareness creates an opportunity. Know this. Loss of situational awareness. Errors to occur and improper decisions to be made. Now, there's eight factors that may lead to the loss of situational awareness. And you're going to need to know these. Okay. Eight factors. Information received is confusing or unclear. Loss of focus of the original mission without appropriate rational. Too focused on a single element of the situation to the exclusion of all others. Task or informa information overwhelm us as we attempt to perform all the tasks ourselves. And a false sense of comfort based on misconception of the hazard, risk, or situation sometimes based on past seemingly, uh, seemingly similar experience. Policies or procedures are violated or ignored without justification. Two or more pieces of information do not agree. And lack of comprehensive hazard surveillance. So guys, you are going to need to know those eight factors. Uh, just read over them, look over them, um, and just kind of get an idea of what they are. Proper situational awareness depends on performing the following actions. Maintain effective communications. Know that. Maintain effective communications. Recognize and make others aware of any deviated or SOPs, any deviation in the SOPs or policies. Monitor your crew member performance. Provide information on a, in advance of an operation or mission. Try to identify any potential problems or existing hazards. Communication or communicate the desired course of action. And here's a big one. Communicate the mission status continuously. Okay, we are 37 minutes into this. And what I'm going to do for this particular uh, chapter is I'm going to break it up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop it right here. So this, uh, this is going to be in different parts. So this is going to be chapter 25, uh, part 1. And then I may just have part two, part three, just depends. But I'm going to stop it uh, right now so everybody can take a little break.